Welcome to one of the newest train stations in America, Wawa Station in Wawa, Pennsylvania. Well, if one were to be technical about it, it's not actually new. In fact, it's rather old, but you wouldn't know it by looking at it today. But that's because this station and this section of track between Wawa and Elwyn Station, just outside of my hometown of Media, has not seen a regular train service since 1986. That is, until last year, when after nearly 20 years of planning, developmental headaches, and a bit of actual construction, the service was finally extended this far to basically a new parking garage alongside US Route 1 near the Wawa Dairy Plant and the company's corporate headquarters. Oh, and that new housing development up there too, which has a pretty lame pedestrian connection, which doesn't even include that planned staircase up to said housing development, which, as Alex Davis pointed out in his wonderful video on this exact subject, probably meant the developers allegedly defrauded the taxpayers of the state of Pennsylvania. Allegedly. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I am here for is what lies beyond this very nice hoagie themed station and what lies in those woods beyond it. Because in those woods is the rest of this line that goes all the way to Westchester, a rail line with incredible potential and whose sagas and conversations around it serve as a wonderful microcosm of the struggles with extending and restoring the once glorious passenger rail services of the United States as well as the benefits that such a service will bring, and the technologies and techniques that may make it so. Hi, I'm Steve, and let's take a journey into a fascinating little local story that could just as easily play out anywhere in this country. However, because I am a complete nerd, I suppose it is best to explain to you what is the Westchester Line? Why is the Westchester Line? And how is the Westchester Line? Well, the how we'll get to in a minute, but let's start with the what. The Westchester Line, better known today as SEPTA's Media Wawa Line, was originally completed in 1858 by the Westchester and Philadelphia Railroad Company, which, as the name suggests, linked Philadelphia with the county seat of Chester County, Westchester, Pennsylvania, 26 miles away passing through Westtown, Cheney, Glen Mills, Wawa, Media, Swarthmore, Clifton, Lansdowne, and Fernwood, among others, before arriving in Philadelphia itself. After its launch, and in the midst of a massive consolidation trend in the railroad industry, both then and now, frankly, the line was purchased by the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad, and later the Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington Railroad, both of which would become subsidiaries of the self-proclaimed standard railroad of the world, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Throughout this time, the line became one of the Pennsylvania Railroad's main commuter routes into Philadelphia, and, as part of a trend that hasn't really been followed up much in the railroad industry today, sadly, the line was electrified with overhead catenary wires in 1928, wires that are still used by SEPTA's electric trains to this day, at least on the parts of the line that SEPTA still uses, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, all of this sounds fantastic, and in many ways is the kind of a rail line that people so often would love to have for their towns, a fast mode of transport that's clean, efficient, safe, and serves as a vital link to other areas across the region, and even as a connection to points far beyond. I could easily get on a train here at Wawa Station and take a trip across the Delaware Valley and beyond, all without worrying about traffic jams or if my car gets scraped up, and probably get there faster in some cases, even with one train an hour. Seriously, we gotta get those frequencies up. So what happened that such a route got abandoned halfway and restoring it has seen development hell? Well, if you were to talk to anyone who knows anything about railroad history, you know that things start to go haywire around the 1960s. At this point, the Pennsylvania Railroad and pretty much all of the railroad companies, but especially those to the east of the Mississippi River, were in dire straits. Their passenger services, with demand being taken away by cars and airlines, were losing them money hand over fist. And while they made a lot of profit off of freight services, the trucking industry's growth didn't exactly help this cause either. 
All of this led to merger frenzy in the railroad industry, and the biggest merger of all would be the merger of the Pennsylvania Railroad with its arch nemesis for decades, the New York Central Railroad, among others, to form Penn Central in 1968. Now, given the bitter rivalry that the Penzi and the New York Central had, their utterly conflicting styles of management, and the economic and regulatory landscape of the time, which I don't want to bore you with, but here's a great video about it if you're interested, this merger sounds like a match made in hell. As it turned out, it was worse. In fact, it was so bad that the bankruptcy of the Penn Central in 1970, a mere two years after the merger, would go down as the biggest corporate bankruptcy filing in world history, and it would hold on to that undesired title for 30 years until Enron happened. Admired in all of this corporate scandal and chaos, two entities would eventually become the saving grace that this line and Philadelphia's commuter rail network as a whole needed to survive. The first one to arrive on the scene is probably the obvious one, and that was the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, or SEPTA. SEPTA was established in 1963 by an act of the Pennsylvania State Legislature to coordinate government subsidies to public transport in the southeast of the state, but particularly to Philadelphia, including trains, trolleys, and buses, absorbing two other agencies that were keeping Philly's transit system afloat at the time. Initially, SEPTA was put in charge of the trolley and bus services in the city, as well as managing the operations of the Market Frankfurt and Broad Street Line subways, and a first foray into running commuter trains, subsidizing both of the commuter lines running to Chestnut Hill. And later on, they would start paying for the whole commuter rail system in the region, though they would not directly own it as they do now, since they did this by subsidizing the operations of the second entity that saved the line, the Consolidated Rail Corporation, better known as Conrail. Established in 1976, Conrail was formed by the U.S. government to consolidate and take over the operations of six major East Coast rail companies that all filed for bankruptcy around this time. And, relevant to our story, this included both of the railroad companies that ran commuter train services in the Philadelphia region, the aforementioned Penn Central, which ran the Westchester Line, and the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, better known simply as the Reading. Both the Penn Central and Reading lines were mostly electrified systems around Philly itself, and they ran fairly similar equipment too, but they ran into two separate terminals in Philadelphia, making them completely separate from each other. But the big problem here was that Conrail was a freight railroad first and foremost, as at this time, almost all of the intercity passenger train services had been siloed off from the private rail companies once again into the hands of the government, with the 1970 creation of the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, or as we all know it, Amtrak. While Amtrak took over intercity and long-distance passenger trains across the country, a lot of the commuter rail systems in metropolitan areas were retained by the freight companies, including Conrail, which alongside Philly, they also ran services in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and even New York City and Boston, the latter eventually becoming Metro North, New Jersey Transit, and part of the MBTA. However, just as with those private companies, even Conrail was losing money with their operations, even with the government subsidies, including the ones provided from SEPTA. Eventually, in 1983, Conrail was relieved of its passenger rail obligations, and Philadelphia's commuter rail system would be fully operated by SEPTA as it is today, including the Westchester line. And perhaps to celebrate this a bit, SEPTA finally completed the Center City Connection, a tunnel underneath the city to join the former Penzi and Reading sides of the system to make for the proper through-running commuter rail system that we know today. But only three years after this, in 1986, events would culminate in the closure of the Westchester line from Elwyn to Westchester, inadvertently creating the perfect little microcosm of the shortcomings and amazing potential of rail transport for the future of not just Philadelphia, but America as a whole. And to look into why that happened, how about we get up close and personal with the line itself, shall we? Not far away from Wawa Station, just behind the Wawa Dairy Plant, is the head of a series of trails, known as the Darlington Trail and the Rocky Run Trail. When I was in college, I would hike around here when my studies and work were done, for three main reasons. 
First, it's close to media where I live. Second, it has beautiful scenes along Chester Creek, though admittedly it looks much nicer in the summer and fall rather than the early spring when we filmed this with no leaves on the trees. And finally, the Westchester line runs right next to it after Wawa Station, which you can even see from the trail, and I've walked along this portion of the line that was left to rot for years. As you continue along the trail, you get to see a few of the old bridges along Chester Creek, which have just recently had their tracks repaired. I even snapped pictures of the crews in action. And even at one point, the trail crosses over the tracks. And that leads me to the first and definitely the biggest reason why the line past Elwyn was cut back in the 80s. So if we look at the tracks here, these tracks are actually newer than what we've seen before. As I said before, and I saw this in person, these tracks were patched up in September of 2022, right after Wawa Station opened for two reasons that I've been able to discern. One is to possibly keep the line in some semblance of order while restoration of service to Westchester is considered, but in the interim, they could actually see the use of tourist trains from a certain tourist railroad that we'll meet in a minute just up the line here. But if we look at the tracks themselves, they actually tell a lot of the story of why this part of the line was abandoned in the first place. In 1986, the line had several major problems with it that saw it being cut back. And perhaps the most obvious one, but a lesser one in hindsight, was the fact that it was single tracked from Elwyn to, into Westchester. In fact, most of the services that were run up to Westchester only ran as a shuttle service between Westchester and Media, with passengers transferring in Media to head into Philadelphia. But the big problem was the tracks themselves, specifically the fact that the tracks that were here in 1986 were the exact same ones that were here when the line was electrified in 1928, having only been laid a year prior. Yeah, you're doing the mental math right. These tracks were nearly 60 years old, and because of that, not only were they getting old and worn as metal and wood does with regular use, but more than that, they were made to an outdated standard, which I can actually show you down here. 15 years, but uh, uh, with the Bruno Brothers, I'm trying to remember what's on, get what street it's on, I'll tell you in a minute. So it would be pretty evident by 1986 that these rails were very much past their sell-by date. But how much difference can 60 years make? Quite a lot, in fact. Not only would the track be deteriorated underneath it through regular use, but standards of rail had changed dramatically since 1928 when the track was electrified. The rails that were laid here, which are pretty much the same rails that are here today, all these years later, weighed 90 pounds to the yard and are bolted together in sections using joint bars. Whereas modern standards of rail weigh 132 pounds to the yard, are continuously welded up to a quarter of a mile long at times, and they're made using milling techniques that majorly reduce the amount of defects in the metal. So, it would stand to reason that SEPTA would upgrade this line to those modern standards, right? That's exactly what they didn't do. They didn't have the money for it. So, temporary patchwork was all that was uh, all that SEPTA considered needed for the time. Well, probably they would have likely done more if they had the capital. But not long after that, the track continued to deteriorate pretty quickly, likely due to foul weather being a major contributor. And all this and more caused the Federal Railroad Administration to downgrade the standard of this section of the line from their Class 3 standard, which meant that passenger trains could go 60 miles an hour, down to Class 2 standard, which meant speeds of 30 miles an hour. With their top speed literally cut in half and a horrendous maintenance backlog that SEPTA had to deal with, and as I said, with this being SEPTA in the 1980s, a lack of funding to meet said backlog, that led to a pretty convincing reason why cutting back this line was seen as a wise move. For the other reason, and to see where the people who relied on public transport went, aside with onto cars obviously, we have to leave here and go north past Westchester itself. This 
is Exton Station, around five miles away from Westchester. On what to SEPTA is the Paoli Thorndale line, but to Amtrak, it's the Keystone Corridor. Now, why the heck am I here, you may reasonably ask. Well, it's because five years before the Westchester line was cut back, in 1981, SEPTA and Amtrak began to expand the facilities here at Exton to not only extend service on the Paoli line to Downingtown, which is just past here, but also to improve Amtrak service on the Keystone Corridor between Philly and Harrisburg. To do that, they expanded the parking facilities here at Exton, which you would pretty much expect in an American suburb, but also improved bus connections as well, one of which is SEPTA's Route 135 bus to Westchester and shuttle buses run by Westchester University, both of which were routed here to Exton and as an alternative to the slower service on the Westchester line. In part because of this, SEPTA has seen the Paoli Thorndale line service thrive, becoming the most popular on the regional rail system, and will even be expanded, or re-expanded in fact, to Coatesville in 2025. But it became another nail in the coffin for SEPTA service on the Westchester line. So at the time, this station wounded passenger numbers on the Westchester line, but the untenability of the track itself and SEPTA's maintenance backlog was what really killed it off. However, all of this is not to say the line completely fell into obscurity after it was closed. If it was, I probably wouldn't be making this video. Efforts by local activists, government officials, and SEPTA themselves have popped up here and there almost as soon as the closure was announced. And part of them led to the reopening of the part of the line from Elwyn to the newly rebuilt Wawa station this past year. But given the fact that it's taken them this long to have solutions be seriously presented, it's safe to say that the line has not truly been kept alive in memory by them alone. For that, well, that's what these people do. Established in 1997, the Westchester Railroad is a tourist line that runs excursion trains along the Westchester branch from the line's terminus at Westchester's Market Street Station to the beautifully restored station at Glen Mills, about 8 miles away. Since the line's catenary wires were taken down after the route's abandonment in the 80s, their trains are powered by diesel locomotives, including a collection of old Alcos, a GP38, and a GP9 while their rolling stock is made up of former Reading Blue Liner commuter cars, which were once electric power themselves. Built in the early 1930s, these cars amazingly stayed in service on SEPTA commuter routes until 1990 when they were retired, a lifespan that's only really being challenged around here by the venerable Silver Liner 4s of today. As for the tracks themselves, while SEPTA themselves still technically own the line, the Westchester Railroad is operated with their good graces by the Westchester Railroad Heritage Association and is an all-volunteer outfit, and their preservation works have to be commended, I must say. In a way, the Westchester Railroad and its volunteers are the custodians of the Westchester line, at least as far as they use it. And as a result, they have been closely intertwined in the debate of whether revenue passenger service to Westchester will return or not. And speaking to a few of them, including one of their managers, this 25-year-long song and dance seems to have left them understandably skeptical of a lot of efforts that SEPTA and the local government is doing to return service. And importantly to some, the survival of their efforts here over that time. Uh, first of all, uh, how much you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Derek Slifer. I'm the uh, operations manager for Westchester Railroad. Um, been here for 18 years. Uh, Engineer, conductor, mechanic, um, do a little bit of everything. Time, so, yeah, yeah, done everything here. Amazing. A little bit, a little bit of everything. Yeah, so, um, so obviously, uh, Westchester Railroad has been around since 1997, I believe it was. Uh, how did it come to be, if you know? So, uh, our founders um, actually came from another railroad in Delaware, and they, mm -hmm. had, they had been involved uh, since the 70s. And um, uh, they... Uh, decided uh, in the early 90s that, that they wanted to start their own railroad. So, um, you know, they were looking for places that maybe that they could, you know, uh, bring their idea to. Right. Um, they owned some equipment and, um, uh, you know, they need, of course, you need a place to, place to be able to operate. So 
Um, in looking around, uh, someone had suggested to them that uh, you know, the Westchester branch um, had been uh, discontinued. Uh, at that point, it had been discontinued for a little bit less than 10 years. Yeah, I think it was uh, 1986 they cut it back. 86, yep. So um, in the in the early early 90s, uh, early to mid 90s, um, they actually approached um, SEPTA and the Borough of Westchester about um, operating a tourist train uh, between Westchester and Glen Mills. And uh, after a few years of back and forth uh, and everything, um, both parties were able to agree. Right. And. Um, in 1997, uh, we ran our first train. So it took them about two years to get the uh, railroad ready. Um, they had to rebuild this yard completely. Um, so this yard really was here, but it was in pieces. Right. Um, the the uh, main track over there, um, of course, it had been untouched for 10 years. Um, you know, there was overgrowth. There was pieces yeah. of track missing. Yeah. Uh, people had. You know, it wasn't exactly ready to go it at was, this point. Yeah, not, this was absolutely <laughs> not a turnkey operation. Absolutely so. not. And and uh, like I'm, speaking personally, I've actually been uh, on been uh, riding with you guys a few times before in the past, and uh, I always love the uh, the restoration efforts you guys have done. Not just the track, of course, but also uh, the locomotives and these old uh, these are old Reading coaches, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, these are Reading. Uh, they called them blue liners. So yeah, they were built uh, 1931. And these were electrics. These were MU cars, so they were originally electric. Um, and uh, when we got them, uh, we got them from Se well, we got some of them from Septo. We got some of them from another mm -hmm. outfit, and uh, they had already been converted into uh, coaches. So the Panographs were removed, traction motors were removed. Right. So. It's actually one thing I was wondering, like if, if it would be, if if there was possible at one point to bring the bring the electrification system back, maybe these things would run too. But maybe that'd be a bit tricky. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so, uh, like, what what would you uh, make of um, the efforts you guys have done? Uh, like, what's your overall uh, opinion of them? Like, like obviously, I imagine you take a lot of pride in it. Yeah. So, I mean, it, like, like we said before, it's all volunteer. So, um, you know, everyone that's here, you know, we really take pride in, in the operation. Uh, of course, we love trains, and that's why we're here. Naturally. Um, you know, some guys uh, have uh, gone on from this place to actually have careers. You know, at the bigger railroads, I'm one of them. No kidding. Um, so. Uh, you know, we take a lot of pride in what we do here, and uh, you know, it's amazing that we've done it for 25 years yeah. uh, to, to begin with, and um, you know, everyone's excited about it. That's that's why we're here. We mm -hmm. enjoy doing it. We like um, the fact that the railroad's not not being, you know, uh, left abandoned. Uh, that we can actually you know run trains and provide a service to the community. Absolutely, and uh, and along those lines. Uh, I, I'm sure you'd imagine that um, that everyone here has been kind of keeping tabs on the whole idea of um, SEPTA, like commuter rail service, being restored to Westchester. Mm -hmm. It's kind of been, from my research, it's kind of been a thing that's been bounced around pretty much since the route was cut back in '86. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what? So what do you? Th so, and obviously it's been 25 years since you've been open, and nothing has happened yet. Would you say that it's been like? Like every new attempt has just been kind of a flash in the pan, or has it just been like, just like a mind, or is it just like something that may seriously happen, or what's the overall thought? So, um, at least since I've been here, um, I've seen at least three groups coming through mm -hmm. with ideas on how to re restore commuter service. And, you know, like you said, it was cut back in 86, and pretty much almost immediately, people started to petition to have rail service uh, return. And, uh, you know, at the time when it was cut back, um, SEPTA, you know, they, they had to make a choice. Um, you know, they, they either had to um, keep dumping money into this because, you know, it was cut back for a reason. Exactly. Um, you know, at the end, I think there was only about maybe 50 riders a day. Um, yeah, um, and from what I heard, uh, don't mean to cut you off. Yeah, there, no. But, yeah, but from what I gathered is that uh, like there was like a major track deterioration. Yes. Like the, the FRA cut it down to class two, so they could only yeah. go like thirty miles an hour. Correct. Yeah. No so one to ride uh, it. you know the the all of our infrastructure. I mean, 
you know, the rail alone is from the 1920s. Yeah. So it's, you know, for, for what it is, um, you know, to provide a daily commuter service would take, you know, and this is 1986 dollars, would have taken millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Track work, uh, you know, rail, ties, ballast, uh, signals, um, things like that. So um, all of that effort for the amount of ridership that they were getting, um, it, it wasn't worth it. Uh, towards the end, they were the trains to Westchester, very few of them actually went all the way to Philly. You actually had to change trains. And That's media. what I've heard too. Yeah, you had to switch so, out of media. This was actually like a shuttle tank train, so it really was, it wasn't even a one seat ride outside of uh, maybe some of the rush hour trains. So, um, you know, the SEPTA had a choice, and, uh, you know, uh, it was either Westchester or some other projects. Um, Exton being one of them, you know, mm -hmm. Chester County, you know, uh, had a station at Exton, and, um, you know, they wanted to expand that. And, um, you know, they kind of chose other places to, to spend their money. Yeah, because I, I remember looking into it, uh, I think like 81, like 80, like they were sort of in like 85, that mm -hmm. SEPTA started running to like Exton, Downingtown, yep. and like they prioritized that, which, which yeah, like you have to balance between the two, makes perfect sense in my yeah. book. So kind of a, maybe a bit of a heavy question on this one yeah. is that, uh, especially with, the more recent, uh, more recent talks on the matter, especially since Wawa Station reopened just down the line last year, because I I found that this really started to pick up speed, uh, especially and especially since like the borough council has been wanting to wanting to work on this for a while now. Would um, would the Westchester Railroad and the Historical Society see that as like an existential issue, or is it just like a nuisance or something like that? Or do you think it could be something that could be worked out with SEPTA? I wouldn't call it a, a nuisance. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's more to the story than, than you know what you read in the news. Um, oh, I have no doubt of that. And um, you know, uh, um, I think uh, th you know this idea has come up more than once. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time that the idea um, got the support of, of a borough council mm -hmm. and I think one of the problems was um, the borough council um, although, although you know they understand you know they may understand what we do here they don't understand the mechanics that we that, that we have to go through to actually run this operation I think uh, you know the idea um, that was presented to them was you know, this is a turnkey operation we get the equipment, uh, you know, we fix some of the track, if we build it, they will come. And I think uh, it was kind of sold in that way. And um, we know, being in this industry, that it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. um, you know, SEPTA's estimate in 2018, uh, when SEPTA and PennDOT looked at this, their, their cheapest estimate was like $389 million or something. Yeah, so, and I think it was like six hundred forty-four million yeah, the whole double for track the whole thing. So, yeah. um, so you know, us being in the industry and knowing what is required to run commercial commuter service, you know, um, you need a signal system. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you need track upgrades. Uh, you need compliant equipment. Um, you need crews. You need maintenance. All those things. Um, and the three hundred eighty-nine or whatever million dollars figure that was just to construct it. Mm -hmm. That wasn't to operate it. Exactly. And, but one thing I also noticed was, uh, I also read uh, SEPTA's Rethinking Regional Rail document from, I believe it was last year. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they have the Westchester line as one of the ones that they want to restore at some point in the future. Like, this, mm -hmm. like, me, like from what I gather, like, it's definitely a long-range plan from what Absolutely. I gather of the document. Okay. And, like... Uh, obviously, obviously, funds are a big concern, especially maybe getting the FRA or the FTA involved in it. But do you think that, like, um, do you think that it could that the that it could work itself out in the future, or do you think that it may that even these long term plans may be may not be long for the world? I, I think uh, I think anything is possible, um, and of course, you know. Uh, you know, 
populations change in the area, you know. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the population out here has certainly changed, and it's really changing everywhere. Um, whether SEPTA, uh, you know, having an idea versus actually executing the idea is totally different. I, that idea has always been on the table. Um, so uh, whether they actually uh, have the means to go through with it, um, of course, right now the, the answer is no. Right. And right now, uh, in the next, in the in the near future, and by near, I mean you know, ten, fifteen years. Exactly. Um, the the answer has been no. From yeah. To, yeah. Near future is definitely a relative term on that one. Right. Right. So, uh, did, would it make sense in thirty or forty years? It's it's hard to say. You know, it's it's really hard to say where things are going to go. Yeah. Uh, as far as the riding public goes. Yeah. Exactly. Like from what I've gathered, it's it's possible that it could like. It could burgeon to be like a good riding market for for commuter rail operations, but as you said, you never know what what could indeed happen. Right. And what it, and and like the idea, like, perhaps again, like, if that were to come back, to, uh, like, I I would hope there would be some kind of symbiotic relationship between the the historical society and SEPTA. Like, SEPTA would maybe have something like this for like heritage trips and the like, but. But like that, that's that's obviously a big if I would think. It it is, and and uh, you know uh, the type of operation that we are, um, you know we uh, we really would not be able to coexist with a commuter type of um, you know uh, as far as uh, beyond the the actual equipment and everything how uh, you know uh, they would have to signal the line and everything and none of our equipment is is um, you know uh, equipped. To mm -hmm. operate under you know signal territory and everything. Well, some of it is, but um, the, uh, the the fact of the matter is, um, for for our operation to work, um, you know, we need exclusive occupancy. Right. And uh, to to have to share it uh, with with someone else uh, would uh, it just it, it would not work for the type of operation that we are mechanically. Now on paper, it may look great like oh we can you know if you work if you operate on the weekends and we operate during the week everything will be great um, but the fact of the matter is you know we we, we don't just run on the weekends we uh, you know we occupy this railroad during the week mm -hmm. every week all week for maintenance purposes we have work trains that go out we have um, uh, maintenance crews that are out there working on the right away so um, you know the the idea that 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 we could just forfeit all that uh, just just would not make any sense for us. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's basically you get a you get the tur the tourist railroad, the historical railroad, or you get commuter rail. You can only pick one. You have to pick one. Yeah, you have yeah, to exactly. pick one. And unfortunately, that's you know it, it's kind of a, a tough thing to pick. Um, it know, is, some, and some pe it's po it's a polarized thing, and, and you know, we know that. And uh, unfortunately, like the the news outlets kind of made it look like, oh, it's a tug of war. You know, you get to pick one or, or pick the other. Um, yeah, you know, and but it's really easy to do that, I would think. Yeah, and uh, it makes for a good story uh, yeah. to, to show that there's there's some some tension. But it, in all honesty, there never really was tension. Uh, you know, yeah, everybody knows the situation. Basically, there's mm -hmm. like very few uncertainties with that. Right. Yeah, um, but overall, like, I'm sure it's not the not the prettiest day for a first run here. But you guys are obviously doing a lot of excursions this year. So we are. Yeah, and yeah. like, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, from a lot of people's standpoints, I would imagine for many years to come before maybe. Maybe we see actual commuter service. Yeah, we are. Um, Borough Council uh, in uh, January uh, unanimously voted to extend our lease for another 15 years. Hey, good so uh, we are, you know, working with SEPTA and with them uh, to make sure that you know everything in the lease that needs to be there um, is there. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know. Uh, Hopefully, uh, you know, throughout the summer, sometime during the summer, um, we'll be able to sign that lease, and uh, you know, for, we'll be here for another 15 years. Yeah, exactly, and and of course, you guys are uh, an all-volunteer outfit as well, and and uh, 
for for the audience out there, um, whoever may watch it, yeah. uh, for those that might be interested in volunteering with the Westchester Railroad, uh, how would how could they go about that? So we're we're always looking for new volunteers. Uh, we have different departments that you can work in: train crew, track crew, uh, mechanical things like that. Um, so if you go to our website, uh, wcrailroad.com, and uh, if you click on become a volunteer, uh, we have a, um, a whole page that you can read about, all the, all the jobs that you can do, um, and then you can uh, become a member of the Heritage Association, and uh, that's how you can become a volunteer. Uh, we provide all the training uh, for anyone that's interested in, in you know, working on the railroad. Um, of course, it's, it's not something that you can just show up and, and do. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so uh, we provide all the training. Uh, of course, you know, we're a, a FRA compliant operation, uh, NORAC operating rules. Um, we operate on SEPTA's territory, so we have to uh, abide by, you know, all those standards, of course. Um, so, that, you know, you, you can get a significant amount of training if you want. Um, if you're not inter interested in you know, doing all the training, uh, you know, there's other jobs you can do. We always need people to help maintain the equipment, um, take care of the, the grounds and everything. So there's there's lots of different jobs you can do here. Absolutely. And uh, maybe wrap it up with a little uh, personal question for you. Of the locomotives you got here, which one's your favorite? 7706. Hey! That's uh, it's a GP38. Oh, it's the GP38. GP38, yeah. That's, oh, that's, yeah. My personal favorite, yeah. for personal reasons. Can't go wrong with the Jeeps. Yep. yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Well, Derek, thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> See, you can certainly wave. <laughs> Good stuff. You. Yeah, I know. I think it's safe to say that the folks at the Westchester Railroad are not particularly concerned for the time being of whether or not their beloved tourist train continues to run for years to come as they've just renewed their lease. But that can leave those that perhaps don't care much for sentimentality and want commuter rail service to be restored wanting more. And all the more so, especially since the restoration of the line seems to be not only, not only feasible on a technical level, but it can overall be a net positive in a world of shifting transportation needs and priorities. With a rising trend among younger generations demanding good public transport systems for environmental, traffic, or just better efficiency reasons, and a growing movement of urbanists on the internet finding momentum by the day, a rail line like this would not only be fantastic for the people between Westchester and Philly, but it could also be another success story that more people can aspire to across the country. And every success story only tends to grow aspirations. Naturally, for people to be discussing a return of commuter rail service on the Westchester line, the idea has to come from somewhere. In this case, several groups have made it clear that the Westchester line can be reinstated for commuter service with proper upgrades made. Key among them are groups such as the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Committee, SEPTA themselves, including last year in their Rethinking Regional Rail document, as well as the Ad Hoc Committee to Re-Establish Rail Service to Westchester, which is a committee under Westchester's Borough Council, who published a report in 2015 discussing the state of the line itself, its projected ridership, which was found in a DVRPC report from 2011, the different kinds of service that could be run, at least at the time, we'll get more into that later, 
and the benefit that the restoration of service would bring to the growing region. On top of that came a cost projection, or rather, four of them, for the four ideas they had for it. Alongside ideas that the service could be run with dual-mode locomotives without wire restoration or with DMU sets, the most cost-effective ones tended to be ones that saw a restoration of the electric lines and run either full through service between Westchester and Philly, or to go back to the 1980s as it were and run a shuttle service between Westchester and Wawa and then transfer there, which the second stub track at Wawa Station seems to suggest is possible. And while both the electric services were found to be the cheaper ones due to increased compatibility, with the shuttle service and the through service coming in at $100 million and $112 million respectively to the DMU's $127 million and the dual mode's $188 million, nearly double the cost of the shuttle, the direct EMU service was estimated to have better ridership potential, so through service in my humble opinion would be the most viable option. But other reports would call into question whether that truly was an accurate assumption of the price, and not in a good way. In 2018, three years after the Ad Hoc Committee published their proposal and findings, PennDOT, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, came forward with their own findings, and suggested the price would be more along the lines of $380 million for the line as is, and up to $644 million to double track the line which does allow for much better service potential, but PennDOT admitted themselves to it not being entirely necessary. However, the obvious question remains, why is that price discrepancy so big that they projected would cost nearly four times what the committee said, all for the same trackage? Well, the short answer seems to be, the committee seemed to underestimate how much work was actually needed. For the bigger reason, we'll get up close and personal with the line again. Behind me is the old Cheney Station, around halfway between Westchester and Wawa. Today, the station building is still preserved, and in fact, it's still used as a post office. But of course, back in the day, it was also a stop on the Westchester line, particularly as it serviced Cheney University just down the road from us. And it's also been cited in some of the reports as well as being one of the stations that they would bring back if commuter rail service was to be restored to Westchester. But the reason I wanted to start here at Cheney is because it's a fair assessment of some of the things you would need to do to run this line to good modern regional rail standards. And also why the initial assessment of the line by the ad hoc committee may have been a bit too optimistic. Now the reason I wanted to start this discussion here at Cheney is because it highlights one of the key differences and the first of several that drove up cost estimates for the project between the ad hoc committee's assessment and PennDOT's assessment. And that was that in the committee's report, they basically talk about restoring service on the line that currently exists, which is all single tracked between Wawa and Westchester. But by contrast, PennDOT put forth the idea of putting in a passing siding here at Cheney. In fact, there used to be a passing siding right where I'm standing at Cheney, so trains could pass each other. And that highlights one of the key differences I've noticed between the committee's report and PennDOT's report. The committee seemed to focus much more on restoring the line that exists right now, but just make it better. But PennDOT and SEPTA want to update the line to best operating practices. And as much as some may hate to hear it, and while I may personally have some gripes with the agency itself at times, PennDOT does kind of have a point. And the biggest point of all can be seen most spectacularly back towards Wawa Station. Back here along the Darlington Trail, you can see some of the old bridges crossing Chester Creek. And this could be where the biggest discrepancy between the two reports lies. When PennDOT examined the line in 2016 for that 2018 report, they sent a field analysis team to have a look at the structures. And the youngest of these structures, by the way, this is one of them, was built in 1937. And the oldest ones, ones plural, there are several of them, were built in 1852, when the line itself was being built in the first place. I think you can probably see the problem here. The committee's report simply talks about rehabilitating the structures and relying on their sturdy construction to work for the present, and they only talk about it briefly. PennDOT, however, was not so generous. The report was so jarring that I'm sure it single-handedly created a lot of pessimism about this project. 
They said that for this to work, the majority of bridges on the line would need to be wholesale replaced with every single structure from Wawa to West Town, a whole five and a half miles of the nine and a half mile extension needing to be demolished and replaced if this were to work. Needless to say, that's a pretty big factor as to why there is such a price discrepancy. Other factors included the restoration of an electrical substation, which was considered needed for optimal power reliability, and understandably so, the creation of high-level platforms to meet ADA compliance, and the replacement of most of the catenary poles, as opposed to the committee's idea of just using the old ones to hold up the wires. In some places, that may make sense, but in others... Yeah... But I can give them this, at least both reports mention the need for an actual signaling system to be put back in place on the line. That's right, since this route's closure, this line has no signaling beyond Wawa. Needless to say, that ain't gonna fly in this day and age. Overall though, while PennDOT said the line would serve a growing region of economic activity along its route, that the line would attract the ridership numbers projected of it of around 2,000 additional daily riders on through service into Philly, that the line could well serve as a transit spinal cord for the region, and most important of all, that the restoration of service on the line is feasible on a technical level, the biggest problem of all was that PennDOT was worried that the projected cost and ridership draw would not be enough to secure federal funding for the project from the Federal Transit Administration, which would go a long way to provide funding for the project and help out SEPTA with the restoration. They had something good to work with, but PennDOT feared it wouldn't be good enough. As such, the project sat on the shelf for four years while SEPTA restored service to Wawa. But it would be around the time that Wawa Station finally opened in the summer of 2022 that interest in the line to Westchester took off once again. Not only were the usual discussions being had about it, but there was more. In July of 2022, just a month before Wawa Station opened, the Westchester Borough Council held a vote. A vote that was unanimous for supporting restoring rail service to Westchester. And while it was non-binding, just a show of support, with of course no funding being granted at the time for the project, they put their endorsement behind a unique project that would get service on the line going for far cheaper than many would have imagined. Huh, how much cheaper are we talking about here? Okay, so to figure out why I'm so shocked here, let's have a look at some numbers again. PennDOT's priciest idea for the line, full double tracking and going the whole nine yards, would cost $644 million. The more reasonable option of full proper restoration of a single track line was $380 million in their estimation. The committee's estimate was $112 million. But this proposal said they could make this work for... 16 million dollars. I didn't even miss a one or a zero in there. It says 16 million dollars. How? This sounds insane. Given all that we've seen, what makes them think this will work? Well, to see what sort of idea it is, let's get up close and personal with it, shall we? Welcome to the Rock Hill Trolley Museum in Rock Hill Furnace, Pennsylvania, in the middle of the Appalachian Forest, and just across the road from the equally fascinating East Broadtop Railroad. Oh come on, how could I not put that in there? But in any case, if you're a fan of transit history, there's plenty of cool stuff to see here, with a lot of old trolleys, interurbans, and even light rail vehicles on display, or restored to operating condition, as well as rides up and down their track. 
But here also, not only do they show the distant and recent past, but also probably an interesting future. A future that, if those promoting that $16 million proposal I was shocked at had their way, we would have seen on the Westchester line in the near future. And here it is. What are these, you may reasonably ask? These are battery-powered rail cars. Yeah, battery-powered rail cars. Specifically, these are former London Underground D-stock cars from the late 70s and early 80s, which in the late 2010s were purchased and refitted by a British company called Viva Rail, becoming known in Britain as the Class 230, and were converted initially to diesel and third rail electric power, with some seeing service right now on branch lines in Britain. But also, some of them, like these, were converted to battery power. Rail Development Corporation, which was then a major shareholder of Viva Rail and the Iowa Interstate Railroad, among others, brought a set of these to the U.S. to serve as a proof of concept for an idea that they call the Pop-Up Metro. The idea is relatively simple. Along lightly used freight lines, you can lease these battery rail cars and the equipment to charge and maintain them, and run them between stations with easy-to-set-up high-level platforms, all for relatively cheap. In addition to quickly setting up desperately needed rail services, Rail Development Corporation advertises this as a great way to establish a proof of concept towards future longer term services, which is exactly what the Borough Council wanted to do for the Westchester line. On the whole, my time researching this idea and actually coming out to see it in person has led me to becoming a fan of this concept. And while I don't see battery-powered trains as being the best idea for electrifying rail lines in the US, not by a long shot for numerous reasons, in circumstances that the pop-up metro concept is geared towards, this is an interesting way to restore long-lost passenger services to places that haven't seen a passenger train in years. As far as something like that is concerned, I gotta admire the concept, and I hope it can garner the interest that they want and I think it deserves. If something like this can be a workable stopgap for a more thorough restoration of service, then these would have a rightful place in history as a train that can restore people's desires to take the train. However, when the idea was presented as an option for running service on the Westchester line again, a lot of questions about it were not really well answered. For a start, the fact that they were battery powered did mean that you wouldn't have to spend the money on restoring the catenary wires, yet. So that was a notable cost saving. But what about literally everything else we just mentioned? Rail Development Corp talks about using them on lightly used freight tracks, but I wouldn't be sure even the best sections of the Westchester line would meet that criteria. You know how I mentioned the FRA's track standards way earlier in this video? Well, the line was originally FRA Class 3 standard, which allowed for top speeds of 60 miles per hour. The line was downgraded to FRA Class 2 standard before it was cut back, allowing for top speeds of 30 miles an hour. But now, the best tracks on this line today are Class 1 standard, which means trains can only go 15 miles an hour. The worst examples, at least before the restoration work was done last year, were considered accepted status, which means no passenger trains can run on it at all, and only really slow freight and maintenance trains could run on it. And honestly, even they wouldn't want to run on it before the repairs. Needless to say, that's a capital expense that's unavoidable in this case. Well, naturally, I looked to find a report about this, and I found it. But as opposed to the other two I found which went into exhaustive detail, especially pen dots, this one was pretty short and sweet. And by that I mean it was more like a marketing brochure than a committee report. In it, the proposal laid out four areas where the project would cut back on capital expense. The aforementioned avoiding electrification restoration, the use of recycled rail to bring the tracks themselves up to a working condition for their purposes, deferring the implementation of a signaling system, Okay, and making the stations equally bare bones as the rest by using stabilized gravel parking lots, which is not what you're thinking by the way, it's kind of pavement like so it's not going to be as dusty but it's not as good as pavement either. Got it? Okay, great. So yeah, this is easily the most bare bones of bare bones proposals 
and it can definitely come off as odd. So much so that it turned out that this simple idea had a lot of problems to it, as I'll turn to Derek Slifer. So, um, when, when a group came uh, and presented to uh, Borough Council and said, well, you know, we think we can do this for $16 million. Yes. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. That's actually the thing I wanted to talk about the most was uh, the pop-up metro concept, which, in which, if I may opine on the matter, in and of itself, I don't see it as a bad idea, but mm -hmm. in context, it seems a bit, a uh, bit pie in the sky fantasy. I would say, mm -hmm. as much as I, as much as I'd love to see some like a cheap option there, mm -hmm. but, um, so, but in terms of like what the Westchester Railroad has thought, I assume it's not very complimentary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, our lease, the stipulations in our lease, um, uh, and it's been like this since day one, was, uh, and it's written in the lease uh, in, in, in certain terms, um, if SEPTA decided that they were going to expand commuter service mm -hmm. and, and return to Westchester, um, and that was SEPTA only, uh, if they made that decision that it made sense for them to come back to Westchester, um, we would have to, uh, you know, end, end our operation to make way for, um, you know, the expansion of commuter service. So, um, you know, that was always the, the, um, uh, the stipulations that we always had, we always knew. And, you know, it was something that going into this, uh, you know, our founders understood. Right. Um, when this other idea came about, this pop-up metro, um, you got to keep in mind this this was not a SEPTA idea. This yeah, was not a SEPTA. Was a borough council's idea. This was not a SEPTA sanctioned idea. Now, um, borough council. Um, this actually was presented to borough council. So borough ah. council, um, they created a um, uh, committee to explore the restoration of, of rail service. Yeah. So uh, this committee, uh, they came about in 2014. And they explored uh, every option possible to, to run commercial commuter service up here. They explored options to have SEPTA do it. They explored options to have us do it. Um, they had uh, you know, all these different options. Um, and it seemed like every option that they came to had a dead end. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time they got to a dead end, uh, they would try something new. So they approached a company um, out in Pittsburgh that had this metro concept. Exactly. And uh, when I think when they saw that, they thought, oh, okay, this is something that's interesting. This is something that maybe would work. Right. Okay. So um, they started to work with this company, and, uh, you know, uh, between the committee and the company that had this idea, they presented this idea to Borough Council. Now, Borough Council, uh, keep in mind, they did not say yes or no to this idea. All they said is, we support your idea, um, and we support uh, the, the research to explore this further. Borough Council never came out and said, uh, you know, this must happen, we must make this happen. Exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, Borough Council, uh, they always thought, well, if, if this happened, what's going to happen to the Westchester Railroad? Right. And in, in our talks with, with them, you know, they seemed like... They were very, um, you know, they, if this idea was going to work with this metro concept, they wanted it to happen without impacting our operations. And yeah, that seemed to be the uh, the idea they were going for. But of, but of course, like as you said, like they they may not be familiar with the mechanics of running a railroad. Right. And that I can imagine that would have. Um, fair share of problems in its own right. Absolutely. Um, uh, FRA has, has um, they have very strict rules about it and very gray rules about it. So uh, we would be considered like a heavy rail right. operation. Okay. Um, the Metro concept is considered a light rail operation. Yeah, because they're using old London Underground yeah, subway so, cars. Um, so it's, it, would, it wouldn't be FRA compliant, Federal Railroad Administration. So the equipment they wanted to use um, was not FRA compliant mm -hmm. for crashworthiness. Um, SEPTA, when they pre presented the idea to SEPTA, 
um, SEPTA said that, well, this equipment cannot interface with our railroad in any way. Mm -hmm. So that poses a problem. Indeed it does. Because you now, how are you going to meet, you know, uh, a SEPTA regional rail train with a, uh, a light rail type of system? Now, they, they presented many ideas with it, and, uh, um, you know, I can't really comment on SEPTA's, yeah. what they've said. Right. To ask them. Um, but from our point of view, to share the right of way, um, you know, to have, um, you know, to be able to run with them, you know, it would have to be some sort of a separation type thing, a time separation thing. Exactly. And for us, you know, we need we need this right of way, twenty four seven. Right. We need this right away to do our our maintenance, to do our inspections, to do our repairs to test our equipment, okay, to do, um, you know, runs during the week, which we, we do runs during the week, as well as on the weekend. So we need exclusive occupancy for this to work. Yeah. We've always known that. Yeah, and like, especially since, uh, like, with it being single track most of the way, line capacity would be a major, major issue there. And uh, I'm not sure, like, how close to, uh, like, uh, obviously, from the borough council's perspective, you've been following that pretty close. But I recall seeing in December of last year mm -hmm. uh, the rolling stock provider for the Papa Metro concept, Viva Rail in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of went belly up apparently, and like, eventually they were bought out by Great Western Railway over there. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I've been hearing conflicting reports of either Great Western wants to continue with the concept or they want to wind down things. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, like, maybe maybe you would know more in depth than I would, but it seems like that that idea may have hit a brick wall. Uh, you know, I can't really comment on the, the inside of that because I'm not really in the know with that, but we did read the, the same news stories, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to us, that was alarming um, because this, this equipment, these, these battery-powered... Um, cars that they were planning on using, uh, you know, they came from that company and, uh, you know, the fact that the company uh, went belly up, I know there was some uh, concern over in Europe about, um, you know, what, are we going to have support for this equipment? Are we going to be able to maintain this equipment? Can we get parts for it? So um, that's really all I know about it. Um, I, I don't really know any of the specifics or who bought who or right. what exactly happened. Yeah, but like, it seems to me like it's a like a crisis point for that whole concept as well. Right. Yeah. So, as one can imagine, listening to all of that, the pop-up metro concept in relation to the Westchester line seems to be almost a non-starter due to SEPTA understandably citing safety concerns, ones that the FRA are likely to look dimly upon as well. As I say before though, in other contexts, I can certainly see pop-up metro working very well to start once lost passenger rail or even interurban routes, but it sadly would have to happen somewhere else for it to get that first chance that I believe it deserves. Now, wait a minute, Steve. What were you saying in the interview about Viva Rail going belly up? Well, yeah, they kinda did for a time. On December 1st, 2022, Viva Rail, the company behind these trains, went into administration, or in American speak, bankruptcy, back in the UK, leaving the Class 230 units that see use in Britain out of service for a time. For a while, it seemed like the prospects of both these recycled subway trains and the pop-up metro by extension were bleak, especially since Rail Development Corporation ended its stake in Viva Rail. However, around the time of my interview with Derek back in April, Viva Rail had been purchased by the Great Western Railway, and after some time and further questions about the direction of the Viva Rail concept, it was firmly restarted, and now Class 230s have recently seen service introductions on other lines in the UK too. For a while, I was worried of what this might mean for Pop-Up Metro, but from discussions I've had with some of the volunteers at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum, the concept is still being developed with Rail Development Corp members still making visits to the place to test updates and demonstrate to potential clients. Now, it's worth noting that this is all very much a new idea. And as new ideas go, it'll definitely take some time to figure things out and see what works and what doesn't. 
but given the interest that seems to exist for it, it's one that should be seriously considered, even if the pop-up metro doesn't exactly work for the Westchester line. And it turns out, Rail Development Corp is not the only one interested in it. Earlier this year, Swiss train manufacturer Statler started a partnership with the University of Utah and Apire Engineering for a battery-powered version of their popular Flirt series of multiple unit trains that already see service on so-called light commuter rail services in Texas, California, and Canada, as well as on countless lines across the world elsewhere and it could very well fulfill a similar niche role in the railroad scene. While it may not work for Westchester, it can certainly work elsewhere, even with all the issues in the long term that battery trains entail. For those towns out there that have been starved of their railroad heritage and want it returned to them, the pop-up metro and other concepts now are firmly on the table to bring it back to them. And if these and other plans, like Maine's plan to run 1950s era Bud RDC rail cars as a light commuter service from Brunswick to Rockland, yes, that is an actual thing that's been proposed, then these can serve as the projects on the front lines of what many predict to be an American railroading renaissance. Now, everything we've brought to you today is all well and good, but it doesn't always give the human side of what all this is supposed to mean for us. Well, as I said at the start of this video, I consider the saga of the Westchester line to be a microcosm of the struggles of restoring good rail and public transport systems in the US. In a world that is slowly starting to turn towards an understanding that reducing your need to drive is a key not only to preserving your personal finances and contributing to a reduction of climate change, but also wanting to restore a sense of community and humanity to your towns and cities, restoring efficient means of public transport, especially rail-based ones, is one of the best ways to shift that transport demand back to that oh-so-needed and oh-so-desired style, and it will help the hopes of all of our communities. While more massive projects, such as California High Speed Rail, the upgrades of the Northeast Corridor, and other large projects connecting major centers with exciting high-speed technology are the ones that will wow the average person with the prospect of truly futuristic means of moving quickly, safely, and cleanly, smaller projects like this one should not be underestimated either. Those places with a history of rail service have communities that want them back like Westchester does. If a cutback were to happen to my hometown of Media, an uproar would undoubtedly take place. And the local governments can easily have differing views on them, that's to be expected. In the case of Westchester, the desire certainly seems to be there, but the resources to make it so have not. In others, skepticism about how much benefit it would bring would be there too, which certainly exists with some naysayers to the benefits of the line here. Even PennDOT was worried that the perceived benefit would not be worth the additional cost. However, in this case, I certainly and firmly believe it would be, since like all public transit projects, it provides a lot of intangible benefits that would make Westchester and the communities surround it a more desirable place to live in than it already is. A reduction in car traffic, a reduction in environmental impact, and a general improvement in accessibility for the community go a long way in the longer term to make Westchester and its surrounding communities more accessible and desirable. Speaking personally, I love trains. But I also love cars. I love planes, ships, all that stuff. And I love the technologies and history surrounding them, the things they can do and the people they connect. And by the way, this is all coming from a guy who is pretty deep in the world of motor racing alongside all the stuff I talked about today. So I'm definitely not in the anti-car camp here. That would lead me to an interesting question of where I stand in this debate. Where I stand is, it really should not be a debate at all. What people need, and more often what they want, is a choice in how to get around. And in too many places in America, there is only one way to get around. By car. Even if a good number of people hate driving, or they suck at it. It can definitely be seen as a bit insidious that this means of getting around that's often associated with freedom in this country lulls people to the fact that it has its own tyrannies due to a perceived lack of competition. In many ways in America, trains have gotten the short end of the stick in the last few decades, and their benefits have gone underconsidered or straight up unconsidered. But in the Philadelphia area at least, plenty of communities do have that benefit. And while it is often taken for granted or even complained of how much better it could be, which it could be, if they were to be taken away, the quality of life would take a noticeable downturn for sure. They would never countenance the idea of it being taken away from them. 
But this did happen in 1986 to Westchester. Because of the degradation of the line itself making the service worse, essentially turning the line to a railroad equivalent of a pothole dirt road and the other options that surrounded them. Now, it may be reasonable to consider the fact that one can take the train from Westchester, but you just need to take a shuttle bus or your car to do so. Though I would answer with this, yes, that may work if you want to go to Philadelphia, but what if you want to go somewhere along the former line or near it, like Media or Swarthmore? Transit is not always about going from a small suburb to a big city, it can be about going from town to town. Rail and public transport can just as easily become a lifestyle choice as driving is for a lot of people. Heck, it is for a lot of people in Europe, Asia, or even parts of the US. Just ask any given New Yorker about how or if they rely on transit, and most of the time, they will give you an affirmative answer. And better yet, for those who want to go to Philly, going from Westchester directly means you don't have to take that shuttle bus to Exton, cutting out at least one middleman. That's part of the reason why the Westchester branch was cut back in the first place, a transfer along the way making it undesirable. People want a one-seat ride more often than not, even if some tough it out and make the transfer. Even then, those that do want that one-seat ride and an easy connection to the place they want to go. This line as a through service to Philly would make the trip as simple as my walk from my house to the media station and then into Philly from there. It's the little things that add together that make a huge difference, but they're not always seen as important on their own, and thus can be thought of as irrelevant, as they're simply thought of on their own merit and not in combination. It's the classic missing the forest for the trees. And even when the consensus between the public and the government exists, a lack of ability to dedicate resources and the challenges involved can be a major deterrent. But as something like the pop-up metro concept demonstrates, there are certainly those that are willing to turn the lemons into lemonade, try something different, and possibly set the stage for better things to come. Now, easily the biggest quandary for me personally in this whole saga is the fate of the Westchester Railroad if service were to be restored, especially given how incompatible everything is with each other. The tourist train is very much beloved, not just by myself and rail fans, but also by the community at large, and it would certainly be sad to see it go in the wake of the service being restored, even if it does take a long time for that service to come back. While a practical mind will easily make an argument that the Metro will get proper rail service back to the borough, it'll be hard to argue with the emotional side at times for many that the efforts of the Westchester Railroad should not be discarded like so much crumpled paper. If there's a possibility of making that sort of coexistence come to pass, it would certainly make the Westchester line unique in the US and possibly the world, and could show that it is possible for modern progress and an admiration of the past to indeed coexist. As other projects around the world, from the London Overground to the Shinkansen and TGV, and yes, even systems in the US, like the Long Island Railroad, Metro North, Metrolink in LA, and yes, even SEPTA can demonstrate, if you build a railroad line, people will use it. And if you invest in it to make it work better, people will use it more. And while the Westchester line is but one of many places where SEPTA can, should, and wants to do to improve their services, even if they may not always have the means to do so and must put their priorities on other projects, even if some of those priorities are not exactly the best ones, it's nice to see that there is a genuine interest in seeing a public transit and rail system succeed here, as well as it should in many other parts of this country. As a thought experiment to you, the viewer, I encourage you to look around your local area, wherever you may be, and see if you can find some train tracks, whether used or lying abandoned. Because those tracks lead somewhere, and they connect a lot more places than you would think, and a lot more people than you might think. The story of the Westchester line is indeed a colorful one, full of triumph and tragedy. But as I sit here back in Wawa Station where we started this trip, I smile a little bit as I'm reminded this story is far from over. A new chapter has just started on here recently here at Wawa Station, a chapter that's still being written. And like any new book in your favorite series, its arrival is taking way longer than it has any business being. But maybe that chapter can tell a part of a story of revival and hope, a story we all want to read. And I have a feeling that my time covering this story doesn't end today, or many others around here for that matter, and I definitely got a few of them. After all, it's all part of the big story of how we get around Philly. <laughs>